All right. Welcome, everybody. So glad that you could join us for what's been called the ultimate book group, where we are just delving into the Bible. This is a Bible study, and we are starting the book of Genesis today. So we're entering new territory for this group. And before we get into the actual text, I just kind of want to set the scene and have a discussion about the book of Genesis as a whole. So I'm curious what you all are bringing into this discussion. What do you already know about Genesis? When you think of the book of Genesis, what do you think about? This can be broad strokes. It could be specific themes. But what are you bringing to this discussion about what you already know regarding the book of Genesis. If you're online, feel free to put it in the chat here in the room. Any thoughts or ideas? What do you know already about Genesis? Beanie says, it seems like a series of stories. That's a really great observation that I want to talk more about. So thank you. I'll hold on to that. Joanne? I believe that Something I learned that the first stories are actually amalgamations of earlier stories, possibly. That the first stories are an amalgamation of other stories. Yes, that's very important, and we will talk about that too. Good. I'm getting some great observations already. Yeah, Donna? And supposedly Moses wrote it while he was in Sinai. Yeah, so that is part of. Kind of, we'll talk a little bit about sources and authorship for this book, but kind of the prevailing thought around Genesis or the lore around Genesis was that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, what we refer to as the Pentateuch or the Torah, Torah being the Hebrew word, Pentateuch being a Greek word, meaning the five writings. So the end of the Pentateuch talks about Moses's death. So we know for sure he didn't write that part at least. Yeah. But we'll talk about authorship in general. Yeah, surely. As you mentioned in your recent sermon, there's more than one set of authors or group and they call God the first Okay, so as I mentioned in my sermon last week that there are potentially multiple authors here and that these authors may refer to God by different names, and so that's a way to differentiate between the authors at certain times. Repetition. Certain repetitions, certain phrasings, absolutely. Okay, so for those who just walked in, we're just talking about what do we know about Genesis? What are we bringing to the discussion? Yeah, Joe. It wasn't necessarily written about life just 4,000 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So we'll talk about dating. Yeah, Wendy? I was just going to say, sure, in the darkness, I saw the painting that's called Physics. And it had the um, quote from the from Genesis about God created light and then, yeah, separated it. Um, I've seen it before, I just, you know, but it was pretty mm -hmm. profound to read that scripture again. And to relate it to the drawing, or the painting, Yeah, a very timely viewing of a painting. Um, Wendy's mentioning one of the paintings in the narthex is supposed to be of the act of creation, and there's a quotation from Genesis. There's a lot of Genesis iconography around the church, and so the wood paneling on the window, door windows of the church, you're going to see the burning bush on one side. That's from Exodus but a lot of Old Testament iconography, yeah. So art has a way of bringing out what's in the text. Oh, I know you know more about Genesis already. Yeah, Donna. Oh, interesting. So kind of setting context for the community, for the people. This is where we come from. This is where we've been. Starting with Abraham. Yeah, great. Yeah, Diane. 
Absolutely. Diane's saying what's really important for her is that the covenant established with Abraham is that the people are not only blessed, but they are blessed to be a blessing to the nations. That the covenant that is made is supposed to be not just with Abraham and Abraham's people, but through him to all generations, to all people. Blessed to be a blessing. That's a really important, beautiful phrase. That's good. Yeah, Wendy? Is it also in the Quran? Is that also in the Quran, the story? Yeah, so there is a lot of overlap between stories from the Bible and the Quran. And so a lot of major figures like Abraham are found in the Quran. In the Quran, the blessing doesn't travel through Isaac, but through Abraham's second or first son, Ishmael. It's definitely a couple of patriarchy, but it also gives a clue as to how God interacts with people and how God reveals from it. God's Yeah. So there is patriarchy baked into the text that by virtue of the community writing it, how the community tells its stories, how the community operates, we'll see that a lot as we read through Genesis. And at the same time, it is a story of God revealing God's self to God's people. Definitely. Adini. So talking about the lineage of Jesus, yeah, so once we get to the Gospels, we have two different genealogies. One starts with Adam, and the other doesn't start until later. But um, definitely, we're dealing with characters that supposedly are part of the lineage of Jesus. Anything else? It's really important to history to say that the fall is right up there at the beginning, and that that's what Jesus was for. Mm. Yeah, so the New Testament is going to have a lot of quotations from the book of Genesis. And so this idea of Jesus being a second Adam, and so definitely within that sort of theological context of what it means to be born again, you have the fall, and then you have Jesus as a second Adam, allowing us to be forgiven for our original sin. So we'll get into that as we talk about the creation story. Yeah, Bob. I mean, this is the book that's so great to talk about. So everybody knows what it's going for. Absolutely. So it's great. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. I am really excited because we all bring some knowledge. We know at least one of these stories. We've read it before. We've heard it before. And so we're going to be able to bring all of that into our discussions and dig a little deeper. Yeah. This may be getting a little more tense, but last week you said that these are fables. Is that how the Jewish people actually see the book of Genesis? Yeah. And so let's kind of um, dovetail from that into talking about some themes before we get into the text. But Yes, so I was referring to the first 11 chapters of Genesis, that these chapters are known as prime evil history. So they're not intended in their original context, were never meant to serve as history. So the people are not reading these first 11 chapters and saying, this is exactly how it happened, that they function more as fables. Um, and, and even beyond fables, fables is just kind of a, a term to use to help us understand that it's not meant to be history, but more so they're just stories. They don't necessarily have a, a structure trying to tell you about the way things are. They're not meant to have necessarily even a moral to them. They are meant to serve as stories, storytelling, because as we tie that into authorship, what is, when is this text written down? Or how is this text written down? What do you know about biblical authorship generally? Oral, I would say. Yeah, I heard some oral, yeah, go ahead. Based on my reading, I feel like chapter one, this one author, and almost immediately chapter two, you're into a different author. 
That is spot on. Yeah, we have two creation stories. Seems like a natural history of the world. And then you get into the myth. Yeah. So the comment was, it seems like right away you have two different authors at the Chapter one seems to be one author, and then it switches dramatically to a second author. That is spot on. And so we will talk about that, that we actually have two different creation stories pieced together. So I heard someone say, I think it was you, Shirley, that we're, we're, we're dealing with oral history here, or just oral storytelling, that these stories were passed down through an oral tradition. You would gather together and you would tell these stories. And every time you told the story, it was told in a little bit of a different way. It, it, it didn't matter so much that you got all of the details right because it was about the act of storytelling itself. And we're going to see that when we get into Genesis 1, it's all about God as storyteller. God is creating, but the way that God is creating is through telling a story, through authoring, through speaking, through the word. And so that is how this text was passed down before it came into written form, is that people would sit together and they would tell these stories. So fables is a good idea for these first 11 chapters, but they're just stories, stories trying to get at the heart of some major questions. I mentioned this in my sermon last week, questions of what is our relationship to God? How did humanity get here? How did the rest of creation get here? What does it mean that we can't control the weather events? And sometimes the weather is good and sometimes the weather destroys everything. Does God have a role in that? Trying to understand the universe and our role in it, these bigger questions of ontology and cosmology. Where does the world come from? Where do we come from? And so they're telling these stories. They're sharing these stories with each other. The act of storytelling is how this community came together, connected with one another, and passed down these elements of the book of Genesis. So there is lore that Moses is the one who is um, taking these oral traditions and putting them in, uh, from onto papyrus, onto scroll. Uh, most likely, that's not true. Um, so Moses may have done some writing, perhaps, and putting some of the oral tradition down, but certainly not putting it into a compilation. So as far as we can tell from the manuscripts that we have, most of the Old Testament is not compiled into a cohesive whole until the time of exile, when the Israelites are taken from Israel into Babylon. One of the major features of the Babylonian exile is that they focused on taking the educated, learned people and bringing them into exile. They left a lot of the impoverished classes behind on the land. They brought the learned class into Babylon. And here, when they're trying to come to terms with what it means that it feels as if God has abandoned them, what does it mean that perhaps their faith could be lost? because they're being surrounded by the syncretistic practice of multiple religions, including Babylonian religions, they decide that this is the time that they need to come together and solidify their faith tradition, to take all of these oral traditions and to write them down for posterity, just in case these stories are lost, because it's hard to preserve your culture and your tradition when you are being occupied by a foreign power in their land. And so that's when a lot of these pieces are put together. And so we kind of want to keep that lens in mind when we read texts like the creation story, because it's being compiled at a time when the people are being oppressed and occupied. And so what does it mean to say that God is the God over all of creation? What does it mean to say that God is doing these joyous acts of creation, all while you're worried about survival. I think it speaks very powerfully to the faith of the Hebrews that in the midst of their darkest time, that's when they compile these stories of God being God over all of creation. We have a comment in the chat. In modern times, it's like people talking about relationships by kin. You know they say, He's the nephew of your second cousin's aunt's uncle and so on. Definitely. We, we get a lot of that sort of um, kinship storytelling here. 
that's what the book is all about is Abraham and then Abraham's children and then their children and so on. Great observation. Any comments about that, that this is being compiled during the time of exile? Does that change your understanding a little bit of the Old Testament? Does that bring a new light onto it? Yeah, Joe. I have a question about the faith of Abraham. You know, I grew up reading Genesis, but it's hard. And Yeah, great question, Joe. So Joe saying finds it hard to believe that the people of Israel didn't believe in the historicity of these stories. So I want to make sure um, I, I am clear that it's just the first 11 chapters. So we're talking creation story, Noah's Ark, Tower of Babel, and then a few other weird stories about angels coming down and impregnating people and giants come from them. So just those stories. Once we get to Abraham, then, then the history comes into play. Um, and so we start having some references of the events in other historical texts about these characters. Yeah. yeah. And that's what you have a problem with. Yeah, I mean, we can't know for sure. We can't go back and quiz them um, and see what they thought about it. But I think that there's enough understanding about the way in which creation myths worked in the ancient Near East. Because if you remember my sermon from last week, there are hundreds of flood stories. There were also hundreds of creation stories, some that have a lot of overlap with the Hebrew creation story. So they would have heard these creation stories from other ancient Near Eastern people and other ancient Near Eastern cultures, known that their creation story wasn't the only creation story. And that was part of the oral tradition was telling these stories and telling them in different ways each time they were told. So perhaps there were people who thought it happened exactly that way, but the art of storytelling suggests the fact that they played with it so often that they didn't necessarily think that the details were historical. They didn't have the same sense as we did, but that was even important to get down history like we would write a biography or an autobiography or historical account or something. That sort of genre, that sort of understanding just wasn't in play at the time. So, um, or perhaps they did. I don't know. You know, I, I, I'm just saying what I what I understand from from my research and my reading. But I think it's also very possible that they thought it happened exactly that way too. Um, and there's a way also in which you can turn what you know to be fiction into truth. Um, to say that it didn't happen this way, but it happened this way. Yeah, fiction that reveals a deeper truth or to believe that Noah's Ark existed even if you didn't think it did. To tell the story as truth, knowing that it's not truth. That's an element in play too. Is there a divergence between Jewish thought, say in the 19th century, because you have Christian theologians going, actually describing a specific day of the week and a month or a year and tracing it. it was there a divergence between Jewish thought in the 19th century, let us say, or the 17th? Or whatever, and the Christian hardcore on Wednesday. Yeah, great question. So the question is, at what point do we get sort of this divergence where there's an understanding of 
some more storytelling elements of the text to where it becomes very literal and the creation happened on a Wednesday at 10 o'clock on this day where there are folks who will have sort of that very literal interpretation of the creation story. Um, so that is not a divergence between Jewish and Christian communities. So that sort of literal reading doesn't come until much later within the Christian tradition, even in the Christian tradition, um, there is a time when basically the Christian writers read everything as, as parable, that everything was something that you could compare to something else. And so it's not until much later that we get these very literal readings of the so text. Um, yeah, I would, I would say so. Yeah, a response to the Enlightenment. Yeah. Surely. So you were talking about maybe themes, and then also, you know, what happened when, when, when the Jews kind of lost the temple and all of that. And I'm thinking, I keep thinking the word covenant because that's a big deal in the Old Testament, and it's it's not contract, but it's something similar to that. And I don't know that I totally understand how they saw that, but to uh, try to figure out God's promise something. If we do something, he'll do something, whatever. And it's it, it must have been really hard when they were going through that time period. They weren't even all one whole group. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for relating it back to this time of exile and diaspora and to a major theme. And so this is one of the major themes of Genesis is this idea of covenant. Um, Dina, I think you had mentioned that earlier. Someone had said covenant, Donna, covenant or promise. Go ahead. I was raised Presbyterian, but a lot of my friends are Jewish. And Jewish friends would say a covenant is between God and the people. And his people means he gave us a book of the right? But they said his people, but he first gave us a book of the Don't seem to understand. If the covenant is broken, you have to write that. You have to tell that because you're going the wrong way. So their view of was you're going the wrong way when it brings you back. Yeah. And you know, it's like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Donna's saying growing up in a school with a lot of uh, folks in the Jewish community that when they when they talk to you about what do you say? But also a lot of Christians. Okay. Oh, a lot of Christians. Okay. Christians just don't understand. Yeah, Christians don't understand that. You were saying when you break the covenant, you write about it because you have to talk about this time in which you were going the wrong way. Yeah. So this is so good. Promise, covenant. We're going to see when we get to the stories uh, beginning with Abraham and, and even before that, there are multiple covenants that are established. So we're going to get a covenant made with Adam. We're going to get a covenant made with Noah. And then we're going to get this major covenant made with Abraham. And so throughout Genesis, we're going to get covenant after covenant after covenant, a promise. And so what does it mean for God to make promises to us? What does it mean for us to make a promise back to God? What are the stakes for when the covenant is broken? When we break the covenant, or is it possible for God to break the covenant? That's what these people are going to be wondering during the time of exile. Or are, is the covenant so strong that even in this time of exile, we can trust in the promise and trust in the covenant? So we will be talking a lot about covenants or promises. It's not necessarily a word we use a lot in our common parlance, a covenant, but what does that word mean to you? What does it evoke when you hear the word covenant? A coming together. A mutual agreement. Yeah. A relationship. A relationship. Oof, that's powerful. So the covenants that God makes in the Old Testament are based on historical covenant making, that often there were covenants that were made between what was called a suzerain, which is the ruler, and then the vassal who the ruler ruled over. And there would be a covenant of, you pay me a tribute, and in exchange for that tribute, I will provide you with protection, 
and with food perhaps. And there were stipulations for what the punishment and rewards were if the covenant was kept or the covenant was broken. And so we will see parallels between what were called suzerainty treaties and the covenants that God makes. But the covenants that God makes with the people of Israel are going to have some very major differences here. And I really like that word of relationship. We're going to see the depth of the relationship established between God and God's people. All right. Any other comments or themes you want to bring out before we jump into the text? That's beautiful. So Chris, you're saying, thinking about the fact that a lot of this is compiled during the exile, you start seeing that theme within Genesis itself, beginning with perhaps the most famous exile in Western history, the exile from the Garden of Eden. And then you have the exile of Abraham leaving the land he knows, being told by God to go to an unfamiliar land. And then right away that you have Jacob leaving, um, and then you have Joseph leaving to Egypt. There's a lot of exile within the book of Genesis. Um, one more comment about authorship before we look at Genesis 1. So we had talked a little bit about multiple authors, and kind of that's going to be pretty evident to us in the text as we read through the creation story. So all of this is hypothesis. It is, in fact, called the documentary hypothesis. So the documentary hypothesis is what scholars term their attempt to get to the bottom of who is involved in writing the Old Testament books. And the documentary hypothesis has shifted and morphed at multiple times throughout history. And so there was a period of time in which there were four major authors hypothesized, and they were labeled J, D, E, and P. J, because there is one author who refers to God as Yahweh, um, which later in German, you get the word Jehovah, which is the German form of Yahweh with the... Uh, um, bowels filled in. That's a whole other topic of education that I think is really interesting, how you get the word Jehovah. Um, it's always bothered me not to talk negatively about other faiths, but the idea behind Jehovah being the true name of God within Jehovah Witness um, community. Jehovah is literally just how you say Yahweh with the vowels filled in in German. So that's the origin of Jehovah. Um, so not the original name for God by any means. But anyway, so one author refers to God as Yahweh. Another author refers to God as Elohim, which is where we get the E. The D comes from the fact that it seems as if the book of Deuteronomy with the Deuteronomistic code, so the laws, seems to be a separate author. And though that person who's really concerned about laws has little sections that come into other parts of the book. And then the P being the priestly tradition. And so I mentioned last week in the sermon on Noah that someone is really concerned with making sure that there's enough animals on the ark to offer proper sacrifices. So that would be the P source. And so it's hypothesized that the P source wrote the first chapter of Genesis. And we can talk about why scholars think that is. But that four author, then it became six, then it was seven, then it went down to four, and no one knows anything anymore. Um, a lot of people don't even believe in the documentary hypothesis anymore. It's just completely unknown how many authors are involved here. Um, but all that to say, it's more complicated than just saying Moses wrote it down. 
because we can see that different authors, different pieces are being pieced together. So while it was compiled during the Babylonian exile, it was probably written down at different parts in history. So there were other ancient texts. We have texts of Hebrew scriptures dated way before the exile, but all of these written pieces plus the oral traditions are compiled into a theological whole. And, and that's the last thing I'll say before we look at the text, which is also um, we're dealing with a theological text here. And so as it's being written down, as the creation story is being written, we're saying something about God. It's not just about history or the moral of the fable. It's also about theology. What can we say about God as we take these stories of Genesis and put them down into a cohesive book? Does that make sense? So we want to kind of look at what is the author saying theologically? All right, are we ready? Okay. Genesis 1, 1. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was complete chaos and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome, and it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. All right, let's pause there. So God begins to create the heavens and the earth, and at first there is chaos. And so this was an important theme in the ancient Near East. Other creation stories spoke to the chaos as well. But what does that term chaos mean to you when we read it? What you see from the Hubble, the Hubble telescope. The Milky Way from the Hubble telescope, the cosmos, the heavens, there's chaos there, perhaps. Yeah. Except there probably isn't. Yeah, laws of the universe at play. More order than we might suspect, or more chaos than we might suspect. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, there is a major concern in the ancient Near East with forces of chaos, with forces of the unknown, that what God is attempting to do here is to provide some sort of order, some sort of stability, something that can be seen something that can be known. And so what God is doing is taking the chaos. So it's not necessarily creation ex nihilo, creation from nothing, but there is already chaos and disorder. And so God has to take what is chaotic and disordered, whether it's the universe or what is chaotic or disordered about our lives and to provide order and structure to that. That is the creative act the creative act is to take what is mysterious and disparate and turn it into something that can be seen, something that can be felt, something that can be lived. And as I said, God does this by speaking. So the word, where for us Christians who are reading the text going into the New Testament, where does that theme or idea come into play? Word or spokenness. Yeah, Diane. The Gospel of John. So John's, John's origin story for Jesus doesn't involve a manger or wise men 
But John gets really theological and says that the story of Jesus comes back to the beginning. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. So the creator is God, but the creator speaks a word and the word comes into existence. And this word is Jesus. This word is the fact that God is in relationship with creation, going back to what Paul says. So Jesus being the word or what is spoken, the logos. Now, this is a, a Greek concept that doesn't come until later. It's very platonic. And so Plato influences this idea of the word. Um, but all that to say is John is trying to tie Jesus back into the creation story. To say that Jesus has been there from the beginning. And when the God of the whole universe creates the world... God is doing so with all of creation in mind, with the fact that God, God's self, becomes part of creation through this creative act. God is putting God's self into the creative act. Questions about that? Does that make sense? The spoken word. God is an author here. We're telling stories, but God is telling a story too. God is telling the story that God is the creator of everything. And what God creates is good. There's joy here. There's something to be celebrated. There's emotion behind the creation. Any other comments or observations? And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth. And the waters that were gathered together, he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humans in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. All right, a lot to unpack in verse 26. We'll talk about verse 26 next week. But let's rewind just a moment here. And to see why they say that perhaps the priestly author was the author of Genesis 1, there's this concern with blessing, that God blesses creation and wants it to be part of pop propagating and populating earth, be fruitful and multiply. Um, that is the first command given to creation, that 
one thing being created is not good enough. There is this idea that creation is so good that it should continue, that it should fill the earth, that it should propagate, and that there should be more of it. And so that is the first command given to creation, not just to humanity, but to the birds and the creatures on the earth. All right, before we end, any comments about our creation story so far? Observations? Yeah, Paul? Yeah, yeah. Paul, just making an observation of the repetition of the word good and that there is order coming from the chaos and perhaps that is what is good about creation, definitely. All right, so we will unpack next week. What does it mean that God says, let us make them in our image? And what does that term dominion, that they are to have dominion over all the earth? So that's going to have major theological implications for the rest of human history. All right, let me close this in a word of prayer. God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to study this book of Genesis, to join with the ancestors of our faith, with the earliest people who came to understand that there was one God over all creation and that this God revealed God's self to creation, was in relationship with creation, and that this God cared about creation. May you continue to be moving amongst us like your spirit over the waters of the deep, allowing your spirit to give us understanding of this text that we too might live out the covenant and the promises that you have given to your creation. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody.